Hello grade 12 psychology class, welcome back. As you can see we have lesson two. This is part two for sensations. Uh, you can see we have three key points. Number two was too long to fit all in line, so there it is. Let's go. So sensory adaptation, key point one. Uh, essentially your senses are able to adapt to stimuli. So senses are most responsive to increases and decreases as we talked about last time. Uh, they're also responsive to new events um, rather than ongoing unchanging stimulation. We are able to respond to changes in our environment because our senses have an ability to adapt or adjust themselves to a constant level of stimulation. You may be thinking of something already um, like when you wake up in the morning or um, you know if you're in your dark room someone turns on the light for example. So the increase in visual sensitivity that you experience after a short time in a darkened movie theater. Um, your eyes adjust to the darkness and you're able to see better. If, if you walk into the movie late, um, you have no hope of finding seats unless it just happens to be a beach scene. But after you have stood there for two or three minutes, your eyes adjust and you're able to find your way to your seat. At first you only see blackness, but after a while your eyes adapt to the new level. You can see seats, faces, so forth. You can, you can see uh, your friend waving to you um, like 20 feet away. Um, so your eyes need to adjust to the darkness. All of your senses are able to adapt. Uh, if you look at the circles here, um, let's just read it and find out. Depends on the change in contrast in the environment. Hold your hand over one eye and stare at the dot in the middle of the circle on the right. You'll have no trouble maintaining uh, the difference between the outside and the inside of the circle. There is quite good definition. However, if you do the same with the other circle, and I don't even have to cover my eye, I just have to look at it for a while, uh, the edges fade and I get all one color. Um, essentially, the gradual change from light to dark does not provide enough contrast to keep the visual receptors in my eye firing at a steady rate and the circle only reappears when I close my eye and reopen it or when I look away. Uh, if I just stare at that dot, the receptors in my eye, they start to ignore that change. It's not important. Yeah, it's just a blank, green, flat area. Anyway, um, so what is the purpose of that? Well, that way you don't feel like your toes are always touching or that your tongue is right now pressed to the roof of your mouth. Um, essentially sensory adaptation um, allows you to swim in cold water. Um, you get used to the cold water and it doesn't seem so bad after a while. Um, someone farts next to you after a while it doesn't smell so bad. Um, disagreeable odors in a lab seem to disappear after a while. We get used to the smell of a pig barn if you live near it. Um, street noises cease to bother you after you've lived in a city for a time, and I'm like, yeah, like sirens do not bother me, cars driving by, trains uh, do not bother me after I've lived right on a busy street. Um, and essentially, without sensory adaptation, you would feel the constant pressure of your clothes on your body at all times, your hair touching your head. Now I say that I need to scratch. Um, you would just be bombarded with information at all times and it would be no good at all. So you can adapt so that you don't feel all of these things, all of these unimportant stimuli. Uh, so now we'll talk about signal detection theory, which is key point two. Um, essentially with this theory, there's no sharp boundary between a stimuli that you can perceive and a stimuli that you cannot perceive. Um, this theory studies how um, your perception is also related to your motivation, uh, the sensitivity of, of your receptors, and your experience or decision making in detecting the presence or absence of a stimulus. And the example that we use the most is a radar operator. So a radar operator has to be able to detect an airplane on a radar screen even when the plane's blip is faint it's difficult to distinguish. Maybe there are birds, maybe there are clouds, maybe the weather is not good, maybe it's a different type of plane. Uh, so what factors go into detecting a plane? 
all of those things that I just mentioned, like, is it really cloudy outside? Uh, what is the shape of that blip? Is there like a straight edge on that one? And does that indicate a plane? Or is there a curved edge? And does that indicate a plane? Um, your motivation to detect it. So like, are you defending the country from these uh, possible invasions, then you'll have more uh, incentive, more motivation to detect that plane. Um, you'll be more sensitive to it. Your decisions will be affected by it. Um, is it unimportant whether there's a plane there or not? Then you won't be so um, jumpy about it. And you know, maybe you have a clearer head. Um, so signal detection theory takes all of these things into account when detecting a stimulus. Do you see that on the radar? or do you not? Um, there's a couple of different ways that we process stimuli with signal detection theory. Um, and there's essentially ones that we process automatically. So those are pre-attentive processes. It's a method for extracting information automatically and simultaneously when presented with stimuli. You can see something, hear something, uh, feel something all at the same time, and you can make sense of it. You don't have to think about what all of those are and then think about putting them together. Um, an attentive process is when you are considering a small part of the stimuli uh, at a time. So if there's an explosion that you see, hear, and feel, are you looking at the explosion in particular? Are you listening to it in particular? Are you feeling it in particular? Like what are you focusing on is the attentive process. The pre-attentive process is all of the things that you feel automatically put together into an understanding of it. Uh, let's do a little bit of a game. Game? I don't know if you call it a game. Whatever. Uh, here we have uh, something that we have, like some left brain, right brain stuff. You might have seen it called before. But we've got uh, boxes with blue, red, yellow, orange, green, uh, and then a box with the words as well as in different colors. So I'm going to read the instructions uh, and then you can try it on your own here. Uh, we can talk about it after or talk about it in class as well. So try to name the colors of the boxes in A as fast as you can. Um, that shouldn't be too, too bad. Uh, blue, red, yellow, orange, orange, blue, green, red. Well, I wasn't great at it, but that's okay. Uh, then what you're going to do is you're going to try to read the words in B as fast as you can. And again, shouldn't be too bad. Red, blue, yellow, green, orange, blue, red, yellow. I was better at that one. I can read quite well. Finally, what you're going to do is try to name the colors of the words in B as fast as you can. So this is where I would say you pause and you give that a try. Um, you're going to uh, so go ahead and do that. You probably went more slowly when you were attempting to say the colors of the words. So um, why was that? Well, that is key point three, and you might have picked it up already. It's called the Stroop Interference Effect. So the Stroop Interference Effect is when pre-attentive or automatic processing um, acts as an interference. So we would have automatically just read the words here instead of saying the color of the word. That's more common, that's easier for us. That's what we do automatically. So that gets in the way when we try to do something different. The tendency is to read the word instead of saying the color of the ink. People find it difficult not to read the color names that appear before their eyes because the names interfere with the response of naming the ink color when the two are different. So that's the Stroop interference effect, when the pre-attentive processes get in the way of your attentive processes. And that's pretty common. It's kind of like a bias. It'll uh, affect the way that you think the, uh, the task that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, so we have your job, which obviously has the important terms, and then uh, some questions and some research about a payoff matrix and this decision making um, and signal detection theory. So if you have questions, please let me know. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you back for lesson three.